It's autumn, 1517. To the great consternation of his bishop and the pope, Martin Luther, the young lecturer of the University of Wittenberg, publishes his 95-point thesis. The disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences is reprinted in thousands of copies and reaches all the major European countries within a year. But how did we get here? In 1517, the Catholic Church is still in full control. Catholic means universal, a likely title considering the Church's monopoly over the minds and souls of the Western world, which is certainly universal. Or is it? By the late Middle Ages, the Church was in a crisis. Popes, the figureheads of the Catholic Church, were figureheads of corruption. They were often no better than worldly princes, only caring about wealth and power, not shying away from war, treachery and torture. They often kept concubines, fathered children, and some were even open homosexuals. Cardinals, bishops and archbishops were not much better. Being almost exclusively aristocrats, they shared the same outlook as the popes. Their offices were usually the result of bribes, rather than competence or devotion. In many cases, familiar ties played a role, the sons of popes becoming cardinals and the sons of cardinals becoming bishops. If clever enough, one such church potentate could amass as many offices as he wanted, serving as bishop of two, three or even more dioceses. And by service, they often meant nothing more than collecting rent from the many offices that they held. Actual work was done by the humble parish priest or monk. Most of these men were of peasant stock, just as poor and illiterate as their congregation. Like their superiors, they often kept concubines, fathered children and engaged in petty corruption. Mass was often nothing more than the priest reciting verses in broken Latin that neither he nor his congregation understood. Much of the 14th century and the beginning of the 15th century was marked by the Avignon captivity of the popes and later the Great Western Schism. During this time there were popes and there were anti-popes, both claiming sovereignty over the church. Later, during the conciliar movement, popes battled a plethora of religious councils for supremacy of the church. By the time the popes won, the credibility and prestige of the church were long gone. With such turmoil in the Catholic Church, it is no wonder that Reformation was a centuries-long desire. In the late 12th century, a reforming heresy arose in Lyon. The Waldensians advocated for a humbler and poorer church, questioning many dogmas and religious customs, such as the purgatory, saints, pilgrimages and transubstantiation. The church mercilessly persecuted the Waldensians, and the creed didn't spread very far from its place of origin. By 1517, there are only isolated pockets of worshippers. Another sect, the Lollards, emerged in late 14th century in England. The Lollards were followers of John Wycliffe, an Oxford scholar who translated the Bible into English. The Catholic Church had been using the Latin Bible since the 4th century, however few people in England understood Latin. Wycliffe believed that the prime authority in religious matters should be the Bible. Based on this, the Lollards condemned the pomp and ceremony as well as the worldliness and corruption of the Church. Similarly to the Waldensians, they did not believe in transubstantiation or the benefices of saints and pilgrimages. Initially, some members of the nobility were backing the Lollards to oppose the king. However, after the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, that was allegedly inspired by Lollards, they were declared heretics and had been persecuted ever since. Lollardry also didn't spread very far, neither did it enjoy a large following. The first reforming heresy to succeed was that of the Hussites. Jan Hus, the rector of the University of Prague, started preaching in a defense of Wycliffe's ideas. In 1412, he openly defied the Pope over the selling of indulgences. In 1414, Hus was lured to the Council of Constance to dispute his ideas with the Church's representatives. In spite of having received safe conduct, he was tried as a heretic and burned at the stake. His followers quickly organized themselves and vowed to defy the Pope. When the King of Bohemia died and Sigismund of Luxembourg, the king's brother, claimed the throne, the Czech nobility turned against him and adopted Hussite beliefs. At the urging of the Pope, Europe's monarchs launched five crusades against the Hussites, all unsuccessful. Fighting lasted from 1419 to 1434. 
With a compact of Basel, Ultarquist, the moderate majority of the Hussites, reached compromise with the Catholic Church, allowing for a moderately reformed Czech National Church. Taborites, the more radical arm of the Hussites, lost all power, and their members had to go into hiding. Renaissance and humanism were the intellectual driving force behind these reformist movements. Humanists believe in studying and attempting to emulate the classics of the ancient world. While Italian humanists mostly concerned themselves with worldly matters, their northern counterparts focused their attention on the most popular classic of the day, the Bible. Humanists are captivated by the apostolic church of the early Christians, one of modesty and piety, in stark contrast with the corruption of the 16th century church. Humanists intend to reform the church, not by heresy, but rather by education and careful reform. To this end, in 1516, the leading northern humanist Erasmus of Rotterdam translates the New Testament from its original Greek into Latin. At first, the Bible had been translated into Vulgate Latin in the 4th century. This was copied by hand by generations of monks, many passages being added, others being omitted. Now with Erasmus' translation, there finally is a standard Bible, and this time, instead of being laboriously copied by monks, it is disseminated all throughout Europe in printed form. In conjunction with humanism, capitalism is taking off in Northern Europe. Urbanization is the order of the day, and with urbanization and printing comes increased literacy, not only for the middle classes, but also for some members of the urban proletariat and even the peasantry. Universities spring up left and right. From Paris to Krakow, humanists take up increasingly important roles at these universities, educating new generations of humanists and reformers. In spite of the continuous wars and the church's corruption, or perhaps because of it, popular versions of piety are more fashionable than ever. Saints and pilgrimages, popular devotions to Mary and to the 14 stages of the cross are the rage. Lay people form religious fraternities all across Europe and particularly in the Low Countries. They live piously like monks, without being ordained themselves. They preach and teach, doing the church's job, but without being in the church. One could almost think that the Catholic Church and its services are not needed anymore. This is the world Luther was born into in 1483. Luther turns out to be a bright young man, therefore his middle-class parents sent him to law school, where Luther receives a humanist education. One fine day, while walking home from university, Luther is almost struck by lightning. He interprets this as a message from God, and to the consternation of his father, decides to become a monk. In his novice year, he is wrecked by doubts about his salvation, and becomes profoundly depressed. Getting to heaven is not a simple thing. According to the Catholic Church, first of all, one needs to have faith in God. Second, he has to do good works. Doing good works means doing good deeds, living like a pious Christian, praying and being charitable. Luther does good works to the extreme and gets even more depressed. Johann von Staupitz, his superior, convinces him that salvation comes from faith alone. At this realization, Luther snaps out of his depression and becomes well-adjusted to monkish life. Later he becomes a lecturer at the newly founded University of Wittenberg, run by his religious order, the Augustines. Here he develops his theory of predestination that is based on the letters of Paul. According to Paul, in Luther's interpretation, salvation can only be achieved by faith, human effort and free will being completely excluded. However, if one is saved, one will automatically be inclined to do good works. Therefore, good works are the result of salvation, not the cause. Luther begins to teach his theory at Wittenberg, however, he fails to attract significant attention, since such theories are quite common nowadays. The great sale of indulgences of 1517 will change everything. Indulgences are a key component in the absolution of sin. According to the Catholic Church, to be absolved from sin, one has to complete three steps. First, one has to confess his sin. Second, he has to be sorry. And third, he has to do penance. Completing all the steps is very important, because otherwise one would end up in purgatory, a place almost as bad as hell. Doing penance in general means doing good works. However, if your sin is too great or you're just lazy, there's a shortcut. 
Indulgences are special documents dispensed by the Pope, which can be used to replace good works. Their power is derived from the Treasure House of Merit. The Treasure House of Merit is the collection of all the merit of Jesus Christ and of the early Christians. The Pope, as the head of the Catholic Church, holds the key to this endless amount of merit. Indulgences had been around for centuries, however, as the purchasing power of the population had grown, so grew the scope and power of indulgences. As it happened, Albrecht of Brandenburg, the Archbishop of Magdeburg, Luther's superior, had recently obtained another archbishopric, that of the Electorate of Mainz. To pay the bribes that are necessary to buy such a position, Albrecht took up loans from the Fuggers. Now he is penniless and unable to pay his debt. He asked the Pope for a loan, however, Leo proposes something even better. He will organize a massive sale of indulgences. He will keep half the profit and use it to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica, and Albrecht will get the other half to repay his debt. The best market for this great sale is Germany, and the Pope sends the best salesman to complete the job. Johann Tetzel bursts on the indulgence market like a storm. He claims indulgences sold by him can be used to atone for future sins or for the sins of the deceased. These claims are unheard of, as indulgences are only supposed to be valid in the here and now for sins already committed and only for those living, not for the dead. However, as long as there is a market for them, Tetzel is there to satisfy the demand. Luther takes this for what it is, not simply a scam, but a grave endangerment of people's souls. He formulates his grievances in a 95-point thesis, not only denouncing the sale of indulgences, but also questioning the Pope's right to the treasure house of merit. On October the 31st, 1517, Luther sends his disputation to his superior, Albrecht of Brandenburg. Albrecht immediately sees the problem with it and forwards a copy to the Pope. Leo X is very displeased. What is to come if Luther questions his right to the treasure house of merit? Papal power will again be eroded. Leo must prevent this at all cost. His answer is blunt and unprecedented. He decrees that the Pope is infallible and also that the Pope is the highest authority in the Church, even surpassing the Bible. As for Luther, in 1518 the Pope dispatches his best theologian to try to convince him of his errors and determine him to recant. Luther remains recalcitrant and insists he is right about indulgences. In 1519, the Pope deploys the hardliner, Johann Eck, to debate Luther in Leipzig. Eck is determined to incriminate Luther, so during the three-day public debate, he relentlessly questions him on papal superiority. By the end, he backs Luther into a corner. Luther makes declarations that may well be interpreted as challenging the power of the Pope and of the religious councils. Egg declares Luther to be a heretic and a Hussite and runs back to the Pope with the evidence. The Pope issues an edict calling on Luther to recant his heretical views within 60 days or else be excommunicated. Luther will do no such thing. He takes the papal bull and publicly burns it. Thus Luther officially becomes a heretic on the 3rd of January 1521. Luther has nothing to lose now, so he concludes that as long as he is a heretic, he might as well formulate his heresy. To this end, he writes a series of books outlining his views on religion. Luther reaffirms his belief that salvation can only be achieved through faith. In the humanist tradition, he denies transubstantiation. Transubstantiation refers to the miracle of the Mass, when according to the Catholic Church, Christ's body and blood turns into bread and wine. Luther believes in consubstantiation, meaning Christ's body and blood is present during the Mass, but it does not turn into bread and wine. From this, Luther deduces that clergy have no divine powers, therefore they should also not have special status in society. Instead of a rigid church hierarchy, Luther believes in the priesthood of all believers. He insists that everyone should read and interpret the Bible, not just the priests. Most importantly, he states that the Bible, and not the Pope, is the supreme authority in religion. By now, Luther's works are widely circulated. With every major town having a printing press, books are usually reprinted. 
This allows books and pamphlets to spread like wildfire. After the Leipzig debate, Luther's ideas begin to garner nationwide fame. To stop this once and for all, Luther is summoned to the Imperial Diet of 1521 to be held at Worms with the newly crowned Emperor Charles V and all the princes of the realm in attendance. To ensure he gets a fair hearing and doesn't end up burned at the stake, he is given safe conduct by the Emperor. On his way there, he is cheered and celebrated by large and enthusiastic crowds. Luther never intended to start a heresy. However, now to his surprise, he discovered he did just that and was quite successful at it, to say the least. At Worms, he is confronted by his archenemy Eck. He is ordered to recant all his heretical views. To everyone's dismay, Luther decides to listen to his conscience and refuses to disavow anything he had said or written. In response, the Emperor issues the Edict of Worms, condemning Luther and all those who hate him or follow him as heretics of the highest order, practically a death sentence. Luther still has two days' worth of safe conduct, however, after that he is fair game. As an infamous outlaw, he may be killed or captured by anyone looking for a rich reward. With this premise, Luther sets out for Wittenberg and a certainty of uncertainty awaiting him there. With his days numbered, he can only trust in God, as unpredictable as God's ways are. It's 1521. Luther is traveling home from the Diet of Worms. He has just been declared an outlaw and a dangerous heretic. His days are numbered. Predictably, he is set upon by armed men. He is held at gunpoint and kidnapped. The twist is that the kidnappers are working for his prince, Frederick III, Elector of Saxony. Frederick is far from being a Lutheran, however, he will not miss out on such a good chance to oppose the Emperor. Like all princes of the realm, he has a deep disdain for the all-powerful Habsburg. The Holy Roman Empire is a collection of around 300 de facto independent states and statelets. The most important principalities are the electorates of Brandenburg, Saxony and the Palatinate, as well as Hesse and Bavaria. There are also extensive ecclesiastical states, particularly in the West, the most important ones being the electorates of Trier, Mainz and Cologne. Germany is a priest-ridden and fragmented place. Since the emperor is merely a figurehead, all the church lands are governed directly from Rome. Therefore, all the money collected from Germany flows to Rome. Frederick would like to see the emperor even more powerless and the church a lot poorer, with his wealth and his power thus increased. If he could become head of the church within his realm, he, and not Rome, would dispose over the church's income. Simply put, Frederick sees Luther as a useful pawn in his dynastic plans. After whisking him away, he hides Luther at Wardburg Castle, all the while pleading ignorance about his whereabouts. Luther keeps busy while at Wardburg. He translates the New Testament into German, so that every man can read and interpret the Bible. He also establishes that confession should be a private affair without a priest and that vows of celibacy and those made to religious orders are invalid and may be broken at will. Hearing this, monks and nuns escape their monasteries and nunneries and become new converts to Lutheranism. While Luther is away, his colleague Andreas Karlstadt implements his reforming ideas in Wittenberg. After Christmas, a group of three strange men appears in Wittenberg. The Zwickau prophets have the curious custom of only baptizing adults. This custom is quite unnerving since all Christendom agrees that one should be baptized shortly after birth, never to be rebaptized again. Additionally, these Anabaptists believe that revelation of the Holy Spirit is the supreme authority, not the Bible. They are also millenarians, believing the end times are near when only those chosen by Christ will get resurrected. These chosen ones, then, will live for a thousand years in the kingdom of God. When Luther hears of this, he rushes back to Wittenberg and puts an end to the nonsense. He is horrified by recent developments, as he intended for a slow and controlled evolution, instead of a fast and out-of-control revolution. To Luther's surprise, he soon discovers people do have free will. <clears throat> Franz von Sickingen, the most colorful character in Germany, is one of many who intend to use Luther's ideas to further their own interests. As a petty prince, Sickingen had to look out for himself, gaining fame in the emperor's service as well as infamy when he invaded most of his neighbors. 
he is typical of the knightly class. The knightly class are a remnant of feudalism. They are quickly losing their power to the more adaptive city-dwelling middle class. They also feel oppressed by the princes who are encroaching on their territory and they are jealous of the vast amounts of wealth and land the church controls. Similarly to Frederick, Sickingen intends to justify his politics with Lutheranism. In 1522 he gathers a large army of knights and claims to act in the emperor's name while Charles V is away in Spain. The knights formulate several demands. They want the abolition of princely power and the creation of a centralized monarchy where all men of noble birth would be equal. More importantly, they want to secularize church property using Lutheran arguments. To add weight to their word, the knights attack the Archbishopric of Trier. The siege of Trier ends five days later, when Sickingen runs out of gunpowder. Soon Philip of Hesse and the Elector Palatine come to the Archbishop's aid and easily crush the rebellious knights. Sickingen dies fighting, and the knights are a coherent force no more. Luther strongly disapproves of the knights' interpretation of his doctrine. However, the knights' revolt was just the beginning. Peasants are the largest class within society. They enjoy increasing wealth and mobility, with serfdom being almost abolished. As princes are centralizing their rule, these meager gains of the peasantry are in danger again. The proletariat of the cities have similar qualms. They feel they are held back by the rigid system of guilds implemented by the oligarchy of the cities. In the autumn of 1524, in the south of Germany, a group of peasants are ordered by their lord to collect snail shells. The peasants refuse and tell their lord that those days are over. The rebellion quickly spreads throughout Swabia. Rebellious peasants and urban poor take over Memmingen, where their representatives meet to formulate their grievances. In the Twelve Articles, the peasants demand the abolition of serfdom, the abolition of the church city and the death tax, an end to the enclosure of common land, the right to hunt and fish, lower rents, and the right of communities to elect church officials. To underline their points, the peasants begin to rob, murder and rape, the rebellion extending all the way up north into Thuringia and south into the Swiss lands and Tyrol by next year. The ransacking of castles and monasteries by mobs is nothing new. This time, however, the peasants have an ideology. They are doing exactly what Luther told them. They read the Bible and interpreted it to the best of their knowledge. In their reading, the Bible says the meek will inherit the earth. Consequently, taxes and social classes should be abolished. Printing is extensively used by the rebels, circulating tens of thousands of pamphlets filled with inflammatory propaganda. Their spiritual leader is Thomas Münzer, a radical reformer associated with the Zwickau prophets. Münzer is also a millenarian. He believes the apocalypse is near and he will lead the righteous to victory. Luther is outraged that his ideas of reforming the church are being used as arguments for a rebellion and mob rule. He strongly condemns the rebels in several pamphlets, calling on the princes to put them down like rabid dogs. Initially, the princes were caught off guard. However, by early 1525, they begin to mobilize their forces. Since the emperor is in Spain and his armies are on campaign in Italy, it is left to the Swabian League, a coalition of southern German states, to put down the rebellion. In April, League armies defeat a large peasant army at Leipheim, near Augsburg. In May, they crush a peasant army at Frankenhausen. Münzer is captured, tortured and executed. Simultaneously, other League armies annihilate the peasant army at Böblingen. Fighting continues for a while, but the resistance of the peasants is already broken. They never managed to unite their forces, they had been defeated in every battle, and the cities closed their gates when they saw the tide turn. Repression is brutal, with at least 100,000 peasants killed. Social mobility is finished, and the princes have confirmed that they are the true rulers in their land. By this time, several princely states and imperial cities had adopted Lutheranism. Luther, as a consequence of the Peasants' War, decided that reforming the church from the bottom up is undesirable. Instead of preaching to the masses, he starts to preach to princes. Two of his most important converts are Philip of Hesse and John of Saxony. They are the champions of Lutheranism at the Diet of Speyer in 1526. The emperor is represented by his brother, the Archduke Ferdinand. Ferdinand comes to the table with a very bad hand. 
The Turks have just defeated the Kingdom of Hungary at Mohács, killing the young king Louis II. This vacated both the thrones of the Crown of Bohemia and Hungary, with Ferdinand having the best claim. Bohemia is added to the empire without a problem. However, in Hungary, Charles and Ferdinand have to contend with the anti habsburg faction on one part and the Ottomans on the other. In Italy, imperial forces are still engaged against France, Venice, Florence and the Pope in the War of the League of Cognac. Thus, Ferdinand has to make concessions to the Lutherans in order to obtain their help and cooperation. The Edict of Worms is temporarily suspended and it is left up to the princes to choose the religion of their provinces. Therefore, princes become the effective heads of their churches, establishing the cuius regio eius religio principle, meaning he who rules the land chooses the religion. While Lutherans are being burned at the stake in Habsburg lands, more and more German states become Lutheran. Prussia, Ansbach, Brunswick, Hesse, Saxony, Silesia, the cities of Nürnberg, Strasbourg, Augsburg, Frankfurt, Lübeck, Bremen and Hamburg had become Lutheran. Luther doesn't take direct part in the process of reformation, as he believes the worldly power of the prince or the city oligarchs should decide. Thus, church and state are no longer separate. Printers, pamphleteers and the young graduates of the University of Wittenberg provide the foot soldiers for the reformation. Luther continues his writing and serves as advisor for several Protestant princes. Lutheranism also spreads beyond Germany. In 1527, Gustav Vasa initiates the Swedish Reformation. Lutheranism had already developed roots in Sweden. The New Testament had been translated to Swedish in 1526 and Olaus Petri, a Wittenberg-educated theologian, is advising the king. Sweden had just gained independence from the Kalmar Union, a personal union of Scandinavian countries headed by the Danish king. During the Kalmar Union, power shifted from the monarch to the nobility and the clergy. Gustav I, a shrewd politician, clearly sees Lutheranism's advantages in building a strong centralized monarchy. Therefore, in 1527, at the Assembly of the Estates, he proposes to make himself the head of the church, to confiscate all clerical assets, to subject clergy to secular law and to declare the Bible the supreme authority in matters of religion. The Estates approves his proposal and Lutheranism becomes the official state religion of Sweden and by default of Finland then in personal union with Sweden. Lutheranism had also come to Denmark. It was already adopted in the south in the lands ruled by the Crown Prince Christian and tolerated in the rest of the country. When King Frederick I dies in 1533, the nobility and the clergy side with Christian's younger brother. A civil war ensues, however, when the rebels ask Lübeck for help, popular opinion turns against them. Christian III is victorious and in 1536, Lutheranism becomes the state religion of Denmark. Like in Sweden, the king uses religion to strengthen himself, confiscating clerical estates and arresting bishops and nobles who opposed him. Later, Lutheranism would be spread to the king's other domains, Norway, Iceland and Greenland. Simultaneously, Lutheranism spreads to France. Unlike lesser kings, Francis' monarch already has the right to name bishops and tax the church. Therefore, Francis I has no particular motivation to reform the church, however, being an avid humanist, he has a natural curiosity and tolerance to new ideas. The downfall of this nascent Protestantism comes in 1534, when radicals nail an anti-Catholic pamphlet to the door of the king's bedchamber. Francis sees this as a personal affront and starts to persecute Protestants. Many flee, others go underground, waiting for more favorable conditions. Across the channel, the exact opposite happens. King Henry VIII is a staunch conservative who hates Luther, but he has a major problem. His wife, Catherine of Aragon, hasn't given him a male heir and she is already over 40. Therefore, in 1527, he requests a divorce from the Pope. Catherine, however, is Charles V's aunt, and after the sack of Rome, Pope Clement VII is in the Emperor's pocket. Henry's request is refused, so the king decides to follow the Protestant example and break from Rome. He achieves this in 1534 and subsequently starts to confiscate church property. In 1536, a pro-Catholic rebellion breaks out in the north. The Pilgrimage of Grace convinces Henry that further religious reform is not needed. Since all he wanted was to become the head of the church, he considers the English Reformation done. 
Meanwhile, Germany prepares for the Imperial Diet of 1529 to be held at Speyer. Ferdinand has a much stronger hand than three years before. Imperial armies were once again victorious in Italy, and Francis I seems finally ready to make peace. Ferdinand declares that all heretical activities must be suspended until a proper church council is convened, and all property and offices of the Catholic Church should be restored. <clears throat> this is unacceptable to the Lutherans, therefore they leave the Diet in protest. This is where the name Protestant comes from. A few months later, fortunes turn. The Ottomans have attacked again and are besieging Vienna. Charles V decides to convene another diet the next year, where he would attend in person. His plan is to hammer out some sort of a compromise so that the resources of the Holy Roman Empire could be used to fight the Turk instead of being wasted on internal squabbles. The Protestants also come with compromise in mind. Philip Melanchthon, Luther's colleague, drafts the Augsburg Confessions, a document detailing what Lutheran convictions are and defending them based on the Bible. Even though the Augsburg Confession was intended to be a rather conciliatory document, Charles still judges it excessive. Nevertheless, he proposes for the Catholic princes to write a refutation. Six weeks later, the refutation is published and Charles realizes that compromise between Catholics and Protestants is impossible. The Augsburg Diet ends in a stalemate. Charles is unable to take action against the Protestants, as France allies with the Ottomans and attacks against the Empire continue from the East, the West and the Mediterranean. In 1532, as the Ottomans approach Vienna once again, Ferdinand is forced to grant religious peace to the Lutherans in return for their help. Nevertheless, the Lutheran princes see the writing on the wall. They are safe for now, but what about later? To guard themselves against Catholic aggression, the Protestants formed the Schmalkaldic League in 1531. With the leadership of Philip of Hesse and Frederick of Saxony, the League grows powerful, even concluding an alliance with Denmark. Lutheranism now has a sure footing in the Holy Roman Empire. However, events elsewhere will overtake Lutheranism in scope and determination. It's 1519. Huldrich Zwingli starts his job as a priest in Zürich. Zürich is already leaning towards church reform, so Zwingli is the perfect man for the job. Zwingli was born in the canton of St. Gallen and is the same age as Luther. Like Luther, he was educated at a humanist university in Basel. In 1506 he became a priest. In 1513 he joined the Swiss army and participated in the Battle of Novara. Returning home, he started reading humanists, particularly Erasmus. By the time he assumes his position in Zurich, he is already aware of Luther's teachings. His doctrine will be a mixture of Lutheranism and Erasmian humanism. Like Erasmus, Zwingli believes that the ideal world would be one resembling the apostolic church of the early Christians as portrayed in the Bible, a world based on simplicity and piety and nothing else. But unlike Luther, Zwingli is a practical man. He believes there should be absolutely no separation between church and state. Zwingli is primarily interested in civic reform. He believes religious and secular authorities should work hand in hand and on equal footing to conduct civic reforms that would be informed by the Bible. Zwingli's first open conflict with the church comes in 1522, when he organizes a barbecue during Lent. He argues that the concept of Lent is not in the Bible, therefore it's irrelevant. Later, Zwingli and a few other priests cause controversy again when they marry their girlfriends in a very public ceremony. Zwingli again argues that priestly celibacy is not in the Bible, therefore it's unnecessary. Wanting to resolve the conflict, in 1523 the city authorities call a debate between Zwingli and Catholic representatives. Zwingli wins the debate and henceforth he will decide the future of Zurich's church and the city's politics. He begins with the abolishing of the Mass. Unlike Luther, he doesn't believe in either transubstantiation or consubstantiation, claiming that the body and blood of Christ is not present in any form in bread and wine. Henceforth, communion will only be had four times a year, and church service will focus solely on preaching. He also orders the removal of statues, paintings and stained glass windows, since these weren't in the Bible either, therefore, according to Zwingli, they constitute idolatry. Church property is seized, and Zwingli opens a school to train missionaries and manufacture pamphlets. 
He exports his ideas far and wide, and soon the more urbanized northern cantons joined Zurich in adopting Zwinglianism. This is too much for the more rural and more conservative cantons in the south. To the urging of Johann Eck, Luther's old nemesis, five Catholic cantons form an alliance to protect themselves from Zwingli's reformation. As a consequence, Zwingli and his followers become alarmed and form an even larger Protestant alliance to protect themselves from Catholics. In response, the Catholic League concludes an alliance with Ferdinand. Zwinglians see this alliance as a declaration of war. Both sides mobilize, however, war is averted when saner minds prevail. To strengthen his alliance, Zwingli appeals to the Lutheran princes of Germany for help. Philip of Hesse is eager to form an alliance with the Swiss, therefore in 1529 he organizes a meeting between Luther and Zwingli. Zwingli had been conversing with Luther for a while, however the two men don't think very highly of each other. Luther brings a list of 15 principles Zwingli must agree to. Zwingli agrees to 14 points, however he disputes the last point, consubstantiation. Luther believes that the spirit of Jesus Christ is present in bread and wine in the form of consubstantiation. Zwingli insists this is nonsense. The negotiations break down on this one issue and the Zwinglians are left to face the Catholics alone. Zwingli tries to plead his case to France and then to the Emperor at the Diet of Augsburg, but nobody gives him much thought. He becomes even more radicalized and urges his allies to attack the Catholics. Eventually, a blockade is imposed against the Catholic cantons, however, all this does is anger them even more. In 1531, the Catholics decide to attack. This catches the Protestants by surprise and they fail to mobilize effectively. Zurich's forces are outnumbered 3 to 1, however Zwingli is undeterred. He dons his armor and fights in the front ranks. As his army is routed, he himself falls. Protestants are left without a leader, however Protestantism is strong enough to survive. Peace is concluded with the Catholics, and the north of Switzerland becomes a bastion of Protestantism. But Zwinglians weren't the only Protestants in the Swiss Confederacy. With Zwingli's rise, there came the Anabaptists of Zurich. Like their German counterparts, these Anabaptists believe in adult baptism and reject infant baptism. They are even more radical in their desire to return to the Apostolic Church. Unlike Zwingli, they outright reject the state, seeing it as evil. They refuse to pay taxes, refuse to serve in the army, they don't have priests, and they isolate themselves from the rest of the community. Understandably, Zwingli doesn't take kindly to the Anabaptists. In 1526, they are given an ultimatum, either stop adult baptism or die. After Zwingli shows them he means business by drowning a few heretics, the Anabaptists flee Zurich. Due to their unconventional beliefs, both Catholics and Protestants persecute them wherever they go. A group winds up in Moravia, under the leadership of Jakob Hutter, who advocates communal ownership of goods, a primitive form of communism. Hutter is eventually burned as a heretic, however his followers will become the ancestors of the Hutterites, eventually ending up in the New World. Another group seeks refuge in the Netherlands. Their leader is Melchior Hoffmann, a visionary millenarian. He believes the second coming of Christ is near, and it will happen in Strasbourg. Hoffmann goes to Strasbourg, where he is promptly arrested. One of his lieutenants, Jan Matis, becomes the man in charge. Matis also has a vision. He claims the second coming will happen in Münster. Therefore, in 1534, Matis and his followers go there and through an audacious coup take over the city. Adult baptism is immediately introduced and those who refuse are driven out. Münster's expelled bishop soon gathers reinforcements from the princes who are anxious to avoid another peasant's war. As the bishop lays siege to the city, Matisse introduces communism and later polygamy. After a year, Münster succumbs and the Anabaptists are massacred to the last person. The Anabaptists still in the Netherlands reform themselves under the leadership of Menno Simons. They denounce all violence and survive in the Netherlands at the fringes of society. Their descendants will become the Amish and the Mennonites. Another group influenced by the Anabaptists are the Unitarians. Their ideas are very similar to the Aryan Christians of the 5th century and the Gnostic movements of the High Middle Ages. They reject the Trinity of Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and insist that God alone is divine and Jesus was a mere person. 
they are also persecuted and finally end up in Poland and Transylvania, where religious toleration is already the norm. Later these denominations will spawn numerous offshoots, ending up in England and from there in the New World. Shortly after Zwingli's death, the Swiss Confederation again becomes the center of the Reformation with John Calvin. Calvin was born in 1509 in Picardy, a full 26 years after Luther. In his youth he studies law and comes under the influence of the humanists and protestants of Paris. His awakening and conversion is a slow process, but by the mid-1530s he considers himself a protestant. In 1534 Francis I starts persecuting protestants, therefore in 1535 Calvin flees to Basel. Here he continues his religious studies and starts to formulate his belief in his book The Institutions of the Christian Religion. In most questions Calvin agrees with Luther, however on the question of the Lord's Supper he shares Zwingli's view. He is also stricter on predestination, claiming that God has already decided not only who goes to heaven, but also who goes to hell. There is no way to influence the outcome or to know who is selected for what. However, Calvin assumes that those who are selected for heaven will live pious and successful lives. Little does Calvin know, but this feature will make his teachings very attractive to the virtue signaling middle class. In 1536 Calvin is on his way to Strasbourg, however he makes a detour to Geneva where a fellow reformer, William Farrell, is working as a pastor. Calvin is also hired as a pastor and the two men begin to reform Geneva. Here Calvin's real nature comes out. Like Zwingli, Calvin is mainly concerned with ethics rather than theology. He is also a civic reformer and believes that church and state should work hand in hand to bring about a total reform of society that would be strictly based on the Bible. This is much to the displeasure of the nobles and merchants of the city as they see it as an attack on their liberties. In 1538 Calvin and Farrell are asked to leave Geneva. Calvin receives an invitation from Martin Bucer, the reformer of Strasbourg. Strasbourg was one of the first cities to adopt Lutheranism and Bucer, its leader and civic reformer, is an excellent role model for Calvin. In 1541 the citizens of Geneva have a change of heart and ask Calvin to come back. Calvin agrees on condition that they will let him do the necessary reforms. Calvin puts the greatest emphasis on religious education, especially of the young. He establishes four groups of church officials, pastors to preach, doctors to instruct believers in the faith, elders to provide discipline and deacons to administer to the poor. He introduces the consistory, a religious court made up of pastors and lay people. He also bans painting, sculpture, music, dancing, swearing and theatre. However, he does allow usury, provided the interest is fair. Pubs are only allowed to function if scripture is read aloud to the patrons. Calvin's detractors try to resist, but this is an uphill battle. Calvin wins argument after argument, and when Protestant refugees arrive from France, the balance of power shifts in Calvin's favor. By 1555 his power is unchallenged. Under his leadership Geneva becomes the most pious, most industrious and most orderly city in Europe. All who visit Geneva are amazed. Missionaries range far and wide and Calvin's pamphlets are being read all across Europe. The middle and upper classes find it particularly attractive, seeing it as a more potent and more fashionable form of Protestantism. Many who were already open to Lutheranism soon become Calvinists. The southwest of France and the Low Countries soon become bastions of Calvinism. In these places Calvinism becomes even more politicized than Lutheranism. In France the southern aristocrats see Calvinism as a counterweight to the centralizing policy of the monarchy. In the Low Countries it becomes a vehicle for the province's quest for autonomy and later independence. As the Counter-Reformation kicks into high gear, Calvinism and Catholicism are on a crash course. Many fear that war cannot be averted. It's the 1530s. While Calvin is working on his theory, in Germany there is a sort of cold war. The religious peace of 1532 is holding, but just barely. The emperor is just as eager to crush the rebellious protestant princes, but for now he is still embroiled in a vicious war on free fronts with the Ottomans and the French. He absolutely needs the help of the princes, therefore he must accommodate even the most bellicose ones. 
John Frederick I, Elector of Saxony, and Philip of Hesse are on a warpath. They have a long-standing feud with Duke Henry of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, the last Catholic prince in the north. In 1541, when the Duke attacks the Protestant city of Goslar, the two princes mobilize against him and occupy his dukedom. Church property is seized, and the dukedom is forcefully converted to Protestantism. The Emperor tries to help Henry, however at this time he can barely spare any resources, so Henry is defeated again and imprisoned. But not everyone is as eager about punishing the Duke and forcefully converting Catholics. <clears throat> the southern states and cities of the Schmalkaldic League see this as a foolhardy gamble that will surely result in the ruin of the Protestant cause. Instead of strengthening the League, this show of force weakens and divides it. Meanwhile, fortune is turning for Charles. In 1544, he makes peace with France and a few years later with the Ottomans. Now he can finally focus all his power and energy on his German subjects who are in open rebellion. But even though Charles is acting in the name of Catholicism, he cannot count on the support of Catholic princes, who are just as skeptical of imperial power as the Protestants. The most Charles can get is their neutrality, therefore he must gather his own Habsburg forces from all across the empire. This, however, will take time. The League's plan hinges precisely on this fact. They can mobilize and concentrate their forces faster, therefore they can attack preemptively and defeat the Emperor's forces one by one. In 1546 they go on the attack, catching the Emperor by surprise and forcing him to retreat south. Next they strike into Tyrol, but due to John Frederick's ineptitude they fail to prevent Italian reinforcements from linking up with Charles. This is when the Emperor strikes back. He has an ace up his sleeves. Decades ago, Saxony had been split between two lines of the same dynasty. The Ernestine line, represented by John Frederick, rules the electorate of Saxony, and his cousin, Maurice of Saxony of the Albertine line, rules the dukedom of Saxony. Maurice is a Protestant and a member of the League, however Charles had already bought his favor, promising a rich reward if he turned against his own side. Just as League forces almost grasp victory in the south, Maurice and Archduke Ferdinand launch an attack in the north. John Frederick has no other choice but to take his forces north to defend his lands. Charles immediately seizes the opportunity and moves to pacify the south. His forces are led by the Duke of Alba, the best general of his time. The southern Protestants, who were already reluctant participants in the war, quickly yield before the Imperial Army. Meanwhile, John Frederick successfully defends his lands and gathers reinforcements, however he has to send part of his army into Bohemia to block Maurice and Ferdinand. Meanwhile, Alba marches north unopposed. His army already outnumbers John Frederick's by 2 to 1. On the 23rd of April, 1547, he stealthily crosses the river Elbe and utterly crushes the Protestants. John Frederick is captured and the League falls apart. Philip of Hesse quickly surrenders and is also imprisoned. Seemingly, the Protestants are finished, however, as soon as the Emperor turns his back, resistance continues to simmer, now centered around Magdeburg. Charles wants to end the war at all costs, so he proposes a compromise. The Augsburg Interim of 1548 gives a little and takes a little, leaving both Catholics and Protestants unsatisfied. The Protestants form a new league and secretly agree with the French to attack the Emperor from two sides. The unlikely leader of this new league is none other than Maurice of Saxony. Even though the Emperor made him the Elector of Saxony, he is still unsatisfied. He is a German first and a subject of the Emperor second. In the autumn of 1551, the French attack along the Rhine, and in spring 1552, the princes launch an attack against Tyrol. Charles is desperate to avoid another war on two fronts, so he is forced to give the Protestants a better deal. In 1555, the Peace of Augsburg is proclaimed, reinstating the Cuius Regio Eius Religio principle, meaning Protestant princes are free to choose the religion of their states. This freedom, however, only refers to Lutherans. Calvinists are not included and may be persecuted as heretics. This aspect is most unfortunate, as Calvinism had just begun its exponential rise all across Europe and within the Empire. While all this was going on, Catholics were not sitting still. Preoccupation with church reform is not exclusive to Protestants. The first pope to seriously consider internal reform is Adrian VI. 
Adrian is Dutch and is thus far removed from Italian dynastic politics that prevented reform during the reign of Leo X. His papacy, however, is short-lived, lasting from 1522 to 1523. Adrian's reign is again followed by 11 years of ineffective popes preoccupied with Italian affairs. In 1534, however, the reformer Paul III is elected and his papacy will last for 15 years, giving him ample time to launch a vigorous reaction to Protestantism. Paul recognizes that such things as simony, absenteeism, pluralism, nepotism and the mass sales of indulgences cannot continue. Therefore, these aspects are purged from the Church. Paul also recognizes the importance of education, not just for the higher echelons of the clergy, but also for the humble parish priest, who up until now was barely literate. To make sure that his reforms will continue after his death, Paul only appoints fellow reformers to the College of Cardinals. His biggest achievement, however, is the Council of Trent, convened in 1545. This grand council of bishops, cardinals and religious scholars from all across Europe lasts for 18 years and will prove to be a milestone of Catholicism. The council affirms that the Bible is not the only authority in religion, but in fact authority is shared between the Pope, the religious councils, various Catholic traditions and the Bible. Also, they recognize that the 5th century Latin translation of the Bible is the official one. They reaffirm the seven sacraments of the Church and that salvation can be achieved through faith and good works. They stand by the elaborate ceremonies of the Church as these are done to celebrate the glory of God. The Council also stands by the concept of transubstantiation, meaning members of the clergy do have special powers and therefore they should have a special status within society. All these assertions and reassertions are very important to strengthen the base and to show a united front to the Protestants and also to those who are wavering. Parallel to the Council of Trent, a new religious order is being set up. Ignatius of Loyola establishes the militant order of the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. Loyola had been a soldier fighting in the Emperor's service. After he was wounded, he withdrew to a monastery where he had a vision of God that lasted for eight days. Awakened to his new purpose, Loyola writes The Spiritual Exercises, a self-help book focusing on meditation and developing a deep religious calling. Loyola soon gathers a cadre of loyal followers and in 1540, Paul III grants him permission to establish a religious order. The Jesuits proved to be a nemesis to the Protestants. They recognize that Protestantism grew out of the universities, therefore they place an even greater emphasis on education. Jesuits are like soldiers, armed with the most up-to-date knowledge and the best debating skills. They are often the bridge between church and state, most Catholic princes having a Jesuit advisor or two. In Catholic countries, courts of inquisition are set up and an index of forbidden books is published, making sure that all future heresy is nipped in the bud. Protestantism is finally contained and will not spread any further than it already did. But by the 1550s, with the rise of Calvinism, Europe is already a powder keg waiting to explode. It is true that even in Catholic France and the Habsburg Netherlands there is a sort of accommodation with Protestantism, but this does not mean religious tolerance. Catholics, Lutherans and Calvinists all live in their designated enclaves. With rare exceptions like Transylvania or Poland, confessionalism becomes the norm. This means that in Lutheran states one must agree to the points laid out in the Augsburg Confession. In Catholic countries one must conform to the decisions of the Council of Trent. And in Calvinist lands one must agree to the confessions of faith of Calvin and various other Calvinist scholars. In the Holy Roman Empire the Peace of Augsburg will hold until 1618, However, in France and the Low Countries, Calvinists are on a collision course with Catholics. The French Wars of Religion and the Dutch Revolt will be followed by the bloodiest period of European history, the Thirty Years' War.